Find somebody with an orange lanyard or text Northland to 97,000. Now, just as a quick update on Raise the Roof, the new roof installation will begin on August 1st. It is through your generosity and faithfulness that this is possible. So thank you to all who gave. Also, did you know that your tithes and offerings help support 32 missionaries around the world? One of those partners is in Japan, and you'll be hearing more about them later in today's service. We also have some local partners right here in our community. Next weekend, we are collecting school supplies for tools for Seminole schools. This is an organization that allows teachers to get the school supplies their students need, or in many cases cannot afford. So check out the list of supplies in your worship guide and go grab some supplies this week during the back to school tax exempt period. On Sunday, August 14th, we're hosting our next Now. That's our night of worship. And this one is a little extra special because we'll be celebrating all the towel holders throughout all of our ministries. A towel holder is simply someone who serves others just like Jesus did. We have several areas that are in desperate need of volunteers. This includes Access Ministries, which serves those with disabilities. So if you're interested in serving in Access, any other area, or if you've just been serving for years, join us on August 14th. Dinner will be provided and you can find all the information to register in your worship guide. Today, Rhythms of Grace is leading us in worship. Part of Community Art Connection, they offer a wide variety of programs that inspire and empower individuals with disabilities to develop their artistic talents and amplify their creative voice. Before we get started in worship, let's learn a little bit more about Rhythms of Grace. Rhythms of Grace is a lot of fun. We have a great time wherever we go, but what we are is a worship band. Where we worship God. Uh, Rhythms of Grace is a weekly worship service that we come to and worship. We sing some songs and we let Pastor Kevin talk about scriptures. We love to sing and we love to create a space for those to join us in that worship. And it is a lot of fun. Rhythms of Grace impacted so many people. We were so we with my friends. We like to have that fellowship on Wednesdays with others. We do Rhythms of, of Grace because we have to, to let everyone uh, around us to know Christ our Lord God. Our mission in Rhythms of Grace is to create a space where everyone can worship as their full selves. And that means maybe you enjoy worshiping standing, or you prefer to sit, you prefer to pace, or you have different ticks, and whatever or whoever that is for you, we want you to worship as yourself with us. It's all about who God is and going to Him with your full self and worshiping Him just the way He made you is how He wants you to show up for worship. And that's what we do at Rhythms of Grace, and that's how I've been impacted. Rhythms of Grace is based off of a verse that comes from Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced Rhythms of Grace. I won't weigh anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tyler Lamb, and this is Marty from It's Us from the Video that you watched. It's Us from the Video. Whoa. Surprise! We're here in person. That's right. <laughs> yes, we are so excited to be here today. Um, we're part of Rhythms of Grace, and we've been here before, so thanks for having us back. We're great to be with you guys today. Um, today, Pastor John is going to be focusing in his message about finishing well in the midst of transitions. The writer of Hebrews says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's what we're going to focus on today in our time of worship, is fixing our eyes on Jesus. 
and by fixing our eyes, <coughs> and by fixing our eyes upon Jesus, upon our guiding king, that we have to, to all of us, and you guys, need to cast your inner burden, and if you look up to the heavens and and look full, hit at full of Jesus' face and cast your burden to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Tyler reminded us to look up to the heavens, look into Jesus' face, and cast your burdens on him. So today, like I said, as we worship, there's going to be some songs that might be familiar to you, some that aren't, but what I invite you to do is to fix your eyes on Jesus. While we're running this race, sometimes we are running, sometimes we are crawling, sometimes we are wheeling, sometimes we are inching our way along, Um, but the great thing is that this is inching. Hey. I like that. Um, But the thing that's important to remember is even if you don't even feel like you're able to be on a journey or you're too overwhelmed or you got lots of energy and you're really excited, wherever you are in our journey, um, all we have to do, which can be a lot, but all we have to do is fix our eyes on Jesus, put our burdens on him, and he gives us the strength and power that we need. That's right. That's right. So our minds and our hearts and our soul. Absolutely. Um, We're going to worship together, and Tyler's going to read for us a scripture as we get started. Okay. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me. <clears throat> get away with me, and you'll receive, receive, uh, recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the on first rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or any feet on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now we're going to sing our first song, called Shapebreaker. Let's get it away. Life. You try to tell oh, oh, this time There's a better life There's a better life You got me He's a great taker If you feel lost He's a great maker If you need freedom I'm gonna say We 
take a seat.
that fall in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Everybody sing with me now.
Amen. We love to close our time. Uh, every Wednesday, we say the Lord's Prayer together to close our time. Um, and as we close our time in worship, we would love for you to join us. So let's say this all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Did you know we support 32 missionaries around the world? We do this through financial support, through prayers, and writing them letters of encouragement. One of those families is the Cawthorn family serving with us in Japan. Now, last summer, you might remember, they experienced a tragedy, and we were able to offer them support. I sat down with Gil recently, and here's some of that conversation. So last year, mm -hmm. uh, last summer, yeah. um, you guys went through mm -hmm. a tragedy. Yeah, so, really, really tough time. So, could you just kind of, kind of remind us um, of, yeah. of what happened, and then, and then maybe what's uh, give us an update? Yeah. So um, last summer was a perfect storm. So COVID was very different in Japan. Um, as someone who didn't grow up there and missed family and stuff, it became very isolating. Um, and then right around uh, June, my wife was pregnant with our third child, and. Um, we were overjoyed, we were super happy. And then uh, by July, um, we, we got the news one day as she, my wife was going for a regular routine checkup that our baby's heart had stopped. And, um, uh, you know, a situation with my job really didn't allow for us to have that time together as a family to, to mourn. Um, you know, our church community was, was supporting us, but, um, being away from family, being away from from where we felt comfort, really, and then not really having that time to to mourn, to kind of recover from this and COVID. Um, I reached out to to Sean and to Gus and like, guys, we need prayer. Like, I don't know where to go from here. I don't know where to step from here. I don't know what to do. You know, I I turned off my computer, turned off my phone, and. You know, I think within 24, 48 hours max, um, I had a message from you and everyone saying, hey, we, you guys are gonna get taken care of. Um, you guys need that time to recover. We're gonna take up a, a collection and anything that people bring up will match. You guys need this. It's like, and my wife and I just collapsed on the floor weeping. It wasn't about the money. It was about the time for us to recover, which is what we didn't have as a family. We didn't have that at that time. So we, we took some time and uh, took some time off work and everything and we, we mourned together. We went to the ocean and had a little ceremony together. Mm -hmm. Now jumped to 2022. Um, we have our third baby due in July. Amen. So we... Um, a boy? It's a boy, yeah, it's a boy. So uh, technically our fourth child, but yes. our son is going to be called Liam Kai Cawthorn and he's due in July. Honestly, Northland is a part of our family history. Like if we had to, like every time we share about this, it's like we remember that time as being one of the darkest times in our family's life because we, it was insane. Like everything that was happening, but at the same time, we never felt God so close and we never felt closer to our church family here. I don't know. I, I, I can't stop saying thank you. Well, may we ever be known as a church who cares well for people. And I must say that, um, yes, amen. Amen. And you know, uh, my family has received the care. Uh, my wife, Karen, over three months ago, went into septic shock, a very serious uh, infection. And uh, three weeks in the hospital with antibiotics and things like that. And uh, 
and had to replace her knee and all that kind of stuff, and she's recovering well. But I want to tell you, I want to thank this congregation of those of you that know what we've been through. And the prayers and the meals, uh, we have felt the love, and I just want to thank you so much for that. So our subject tonight, or this afternoon, is called Finishing Well as part of the series on transitions. And uh, I don't know whether it was somebody's strategic plan or just the sovereignty of God that they would ask the older pastoral guy to do finishing well, knowing that, you know, he's probably closer to the finish line than the rest of us, so he may give some thought about this. And the truth of the matter is, I really do uh, think about what it would be like to finish well. If you remember, uh, several weeks back, Pastor Josh was talking about these stages of life, right? You know, like when you're young and you're like in your 20s, you know, you have dreams about, you know, the future, maybe having a family career. Uh, you know, you're kind of invincible and immortal. Uh, and then you hit into your midlife, like in your 40s and 50s, and you start to feel some of the aches and pains, the, the heavy weight of responsibilities of a family, maybe aging parents, uh, kids that are starting to leave the nest. And, and for some time, that, that midlife can become a kind of a crisis uh, for some. And then, you know, there's this point where you start to really feel older. <laughs> you're, you're getting the aches and the pains. Um, and, and I'm beginning to feel that. I just had a knee replacement three months ago because the old knee just wore out. And thank God they got stuff to, to fix that nowadays. But the reality is, you know, there's a, there is a finish line for all of us. There is a time when, when things wear out and we get older. But the question is, how do we finish well? How do we finish well? You know, it's interesting that in the United States, 10,000 people a day turn 65. It's called the baby boomers. Baby boomers out there? We got some baby boomers? We got to, yeah, we, I see you. Yeah. A lot of baby boomers. And, and the reality is there are, a tr and they seem to come to Florida for some reason. Are you right? And, um, and so, so there's been some studies about the baby boomers and, and their re as they retire from their place of work, if they don't have something, uh, uh, a purpose or remain active, that the studies are showing that they begin to struggle with depression, uh, maybe alcoholism and just isolation. And uh, there's a, a program that I listened to on the way here on Sunday mornings called Growing Boulder. Uh, it's out of Orlando, Mark Middleton and, and Bill Schaefer. They interview people that are up in years, right? To encourage people if you're getting up in years, not to just slide for home, and, but, to, but to dream and to continue living, right? And they've, they've done a lot of research that people who remain physically active, and socially connected to people and actually contribute or give back that they live longer and they live happier lives. And I think that's really interesting. Well, the Bible describes our lifetime from beginning to end like a race, a race that we're in. There's a, finish, a start, right? We're born. And then there is a finish line. And we're going to look a little bit at the Apostle Paul, um, who is... Up in years, he is actually facing his death. He's a, uh, in Rome in prison and pretty much pretty assured that he's looking at an impending death. And so he writes to Timothy about this finish line that he's quickly approaching. And I'd like for you to stand as we read Paul's words to Timothy. It's in chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. Would you pray with me? Our Father, as we think about the reality of our own mortality, um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live the days that we have and you have given us well. 
Would you teach us this morning what finishing well looks like from your word? And may we look to Jesus, our primary uh, example of what it's like to finish well. So, Father, you know where all of us are on this race called life. And I pray that you would meet us right where we are today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. So it's no question that not everybody finishes well. Paul mentions a couple of people. There was Demas, he mentions further in this text, who kind of fell out of the race because he loved this present world too much. Uh, in 1 Timothy, he mentions a couple of guys by name, Hymenius and Alexander, who um, just couldn't keep a good conscience and became shipwrecked of their faith. So the reality is not everybody finishes well. So whether you're in your 20s or in your midlife or you're getting up in years, the question we want to ask ourselves is, what does it take to finish well? What does it take at the end of our days for us to say like Paul, I have fought a good fight and I've finished the race? What will it be like for us to cross that finish line and step into eternity and have Jesus say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So to do so, we should probably look at some people in the Bible who finished well. And the one that comes to my mind is Joshua. We've looked a lot at Joshua in, in past days. And uh, Joshua lived to be 110 years old. And he finished well. You remember, he, was, he took over the reins from Moses after Moses passed away. And he was charged with taking the people of Israel across the Jordan into the promised land to push out the inhabitants of that land so that they could occupy the land that was flowing with milk and honey so that they would prosper and flourish in this land. That was God's call on Joshua's life. And so if we were to ask Joshua... Joshua, from your life experience, just imagine he's sitting here with us. From your life experience, Joshua, what, um, what, you, what can you tell us? Uh, what, some keys or some ways we need to think about finishing well. Well, the first thing Joshua might say is, have a deeply rooted faith that God is good and wants the best for your life. And I take this from this first chapter of Joshua as God speaks to Joshua as he's taken over for Moses. It's in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them. To the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you. Just as I promised Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down and of the sun shall be your territory. So God is making this promise to, to, to Joshua. I want you to go in. And I want you to occupy this land that I'm giving you. It's a good land because he's a good God. And he wants his people to flourish. And so, and so the goodness of God and believing in the goodness of God is really important for our journey, for the race that we're in. Because doubting whether or not God is good was really the cause for the fall in the first place, if you recall the story of Adam and Eve. Satan came and uh, deceived them. They, they were given a beautiful place. They had everything they needed. And Satan put that question in their mark, you know, mark in their heads like, you know, God's really holding out on you. He's not letting you eat of that tree over there. And the question mark, is God really good, began to fester. And that's what really caused the fall. It's so fundamental that we believe that God really is good and that we can trust him. Jesus said, the thief came to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And in Ephesians chapter 1, I love this passage there. It talks about the inheritance we have in Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In a verse that you're probably familiar with, Jeremiah 29, 11, you've heard it quoted. You might have a plaque in your house somewhere. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. God is good and he wants the best for us. But there are times in life when hardship come where we begin to question, God, are you really good? You know, when we learn of a friend or a family member that's diagnosed with cancer or somebody uh, or you're going through a divorce or your parents are going through a divorce or you find that your kid is seriously addicted to drugs or there's a bad car accident like happened on 1792 this week where a woman was killed. Those kind of things, you begin to wonder, God, are you really good and can I trust you? In the book of Psalms, the psalmist is struggling with this very same question. Listen to his lament, Psalm 77. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at the end for all time? Has God forgiven to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? You ever had thoughts like that? Lord, are you really there? Do you, are you really good? Then the psalmist takes into consideration, stops to remember. Then I thought, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles long ago. There's a time when we have to stop and go, wait a minute. If I look at my, the race I've run so far, there's, there are moments where I really saw the goodness of God. I was driving through Starbucks coffee to get a cup of coffee this morning through the, through the drive-thru. And I come to get my coffee, and the lady says, that lady in front of you just paid for your coffee. And the person behind you. <laughs> Small thing, but oh my goodness, a little taste of how God is good. And so how important that is. You know, I love it when we sing, uh, Casey led us last week in that song, The Goodness of God, and talking about his faithfulness. I love that song, and it's such a reminder of God's goodness. So, trusting in God's goodness. So, Joshua, um, so you were, you know, you were facing some real challenges. I mean, you had uh, had to cross the Jordan. Then you had to face these walled cities, giants in the land, uh, and, and a pretty serious military force that you were going to face. Were you ever afraid? Yeah, I was kind of afraid, but I realized God told me, he said he'd be with me. And this is what we read in Joshua chapter one. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. You know, fear can be really paralyzing, can it? I mean, it can really take us out of the race of life if, we, if we're afraid. And uh, it reminds me of a time my dad and I, I have some fond memories of my father. When, when I was about nine or ten years old, uh, he used to take me pheasant hunting up in Michigan. And we'd drive out into the country, and uh, we'd find a nice cornfield, hoping to find some pheasants. And, and, and how we did this was we'd line up like this at the edge of a cornfield. And dad would be maybe... 40, 40 yards away, and, and I was like his little bird dog. You know, I would walk and flush up the pheasants. So, so we would walk row by row. You know, I'd walk a row, keep an eye on Dad, right? You know, and we would keep going row after row. And I remember one time I step into the row and Dad's not there. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. So I went up a few rows that maybe he's ahead of me, and I couldn't find him. Go back a few more rows, I'm starting to get into a panic, right? I'm jumping up, trying to see if I can see the barrel of a shotgun sticking up over the, over the cornfield. I'm panicking. I'm thinking, as a kid, I'm going to be out here in the middle of nowhere. You know, is somebody going to find me? How am I going to get back home? I'm scared to death. Finally, I keep working my way through this cornfield, get to the, the, the far edge of this cornfield, and there's my dad. <laughs> Whew. It calmed me right down to know that my dad, even though I couldn't see him, he was there 
all the time. And how true that is of, of God himself. He is always with us. Jesus said, I don't leave you as orphans. I just don't leave you. Um, in fact, I'm going to send my spirit to be in you forever. So we have this promise that God is always with us. In Genesis 28, verse 15, is the story of Jacob having this dream. And in the middle of the dream, God says to Jacob, I am with you and will keep you in all places. I remember uh, putting my son to bed one night and uh, he was saying he was afraid and didn't want to go to sleep. I said, well, just quote Genesis 28, 15. And he says, I tried it, Dad, and it didn't work. <laughs> oh, well, I thought I would try but the truth of the matter is, he is always with us. So Joshua, I mean, as you, as you headed into that promised land, you must have had some kind of guide, a compass, uh, you know, some kind of instructions, you know, you know to, 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 to accomplish this purpose that God has put on your life. What would you say to us, say to us um, guided you? And what Joshua would probably say is, Make it a daily practice to meditate in scripture and other spiritual disciplines that keep you centered in Christ. You know, when you think of someone who runs a marathon, right? They just don't one day show up at, at the site and try to run a marathon. What do they do? They're in training. They're disciplining themselves before they step into that race. Well, in this race of life, the discipline of meditating in scripture is absolutely crucial. And that's exactly what God says to Joshua. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I don't know about you, but I need to start my day in Scripture. A cup of coffee, the Scriptures. It's kind of like to stay centered. You ever, you remember those merry-go-rounds on the playground where you would spin them, you know, get them going real fast? And hopefully, you know, fling your friends off the edge, you know, with the centrifugal force. Remember doing that? Oh, yeah. But, but, but if you were smart, you would, you would work your way to the center of that thing where you wouldn't be pulled by the centrifugal force. I think of scripture that way. I wake up in the morning, a lot of times I'm really anxious. And with a cup of coffee and some time spent in God's word, I feel like I get centered and grounded and I can head into the day. Uh, in Psalms 1, it says this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. You know, and it's, it's not a, you know, once a week I read a five-minute devotional. This is a daily thing. You remember when the children of Israel were in the, in the wilderness and God sustained them for 40 years with manna? Every morning they would go out and they would pick up this manna and it would sustain them for the day and ultimately sustain them for 40 years. And that is so true of God's word as we feast on it. Uh, we hear God speak to our hearts. Uh, we need this every single day if we are planning on finishing well and running the race well. So, so Joshua, um, you had some real, real fight on your hands. I mean, there were giants in the land, uh, and you were instructed to literally push them out of the land. Uh, because if you did not push them out of the land, they were going to corrupt you all. They were going to be a, a negative influence on you, and you would not experience the kind of prosperity that God was promising. And so what Joshua might say to us as we run this race 
He would say, honestly identify and face the sin that could hinder you from finishing well with God's help. And to get that from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lie, lay aside every weight and the sin which, so, which clings to, so closely to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That phrase, the sin which clings so closely to us. Do you have a sin that, that's sort of always there and tempts you? clings closely to you? Well, even Paul, when he said, I fought a good fight, that wasn't just a fight against the evildoers that were trying to get him. Paul had an internal battle just like you and I. He had a flesh just like you and I. He was tempted just like you and I. In Romans chapter 7, we hear him say, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing it. He said, there's a war going on inside of me. And so it's really important that we recognize what are the sins that would cling to us? What are the things that could just really cause us to fall out of the race? Not lose salvation, but really just kind of fall out of, fall out of the race. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, John really kind of boils down and summarizes the kind of sins we struggle with. The lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. When you think of those categories, those are the kind of things that trip people up. It sure tripped David up, remember? Pastor Josh was preaching out of Psalm 51. That, that sin of lust got David one night when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop. And it, and it hurt David. It hurt, it, it hurt his future. And, uh, and that's why Josh says, man, we've got to have some guardrails in our life. Do we not? Guardrails. And, and not only do we need guardrails, but ladies and gentlemen, we need each other. Because this is a race we just can't run on our own. We need each other to keep each other accountable, to encourage one another. And this is what Hebrews 13 tells us in verse 13 and 14. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm unto the end. We need each other to encourage one another. You know, maybe you're out there thinking, you know, wow, I'd, somewhere along the line I got out of the race and I really went over to the deep end. And you're wondering, you know, is there any hope for me to finish well? Well, absolutely there is. I think of my brother Joe. My brother Joe, well he, there's, there's nine of us, and Joe was, if you will, the black sheep. Thirteen years old, he hitchhiked to California from Florida. <laughs> Got a job working with Dion Warwick backstage. Joe was a schmoozer. I mean, he could sell ice to a, an Eskimo. He was quite a guy. And, uh, and he got in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Got into drugs, taking and selling, and... He lived a hard life, but towards the end of his life, he got clean and he trusted Jesus and he pursued the Lord deeply. He got really honest with himself and he faced his demons. And then he began to volunteer as a church ministry in South Florida in Pahokee. It's a town where a lot of underprivileged kids are. And, and Joe loved on these boys and girls because he knew that if they didn't get some loving on, they were going to end up just like him. And he poured his life into them. My Joe, brother Joe passed away uh, several years back and at his funeral, it had gotten started and all of a sudden this big school bus pulls up with about 50 of these kids come to pay their respects for my brother Joe. Yeah. I believe that when my brother Joe crossed the finish line, he heard the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He finished well. So if you're thinking there's no hope, yes, his mercy is new every day. Get back in the race. Absolutely. Get back in the race. Well, if, if you've ever run a long race, you know that uh, towards the end of that race, man, your muscles cramp up and it gets 
harder, right? So how are we going to finish well? The runner who finishes well sets his focus on the joy of heaven. And I get this from Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You imagine as Jesus approached that, sin, that finish line, just experiencing abandonment of his friends that he poured his life into, betrayed by a friend, and then the physical pain that he suffered. What kept him going towards that finish line? It was the joy that was set before him, being reunited with his father. He would train that crown of thorns into a crown of glory, and he would bask in the redemption of those people whom he redeemed with his own blood, who would worship him forever and ever. That's where he put his focus, and that's why he was able to endure the suffering. Now think of Paul as he's at the end of this finish line. There was, most of his friends had abandoned him, too. And he's alone in this, in this Roman prison, uh, probably feeling a lot of physical pain. Remember, they beat the tar out of Paul, beat him with rods. They stoned him, left him for dead. Uh, I, I can't believe, I can't not believe that this guy was not experiencing some real serious arthritis <laughs> and physical pain as he came closer to that finish line. But you know, he speaks of his suffering. He says in 2 Corinthians, he called it momentary light affliction. Seriously? <laughs> light affliction. But he says, will give way to the eternal weight of glory of which there is no comparison. No comparison. That's what kept him going. That's what kept him in the fight. I think of my mom. My mom who raised nine kids. You know, that'll wear anybody out, right? And uh, my mom used to uh, be a hairdresser from the time she was 18 till she was 71. And her hands had arthritis so bad um, when she thought I needed a haircut, she, I said, I, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, don't get near me with them scissors. <laughs> but my mama, she, um, as she grew older, and she hated growing older, she said, this really is hard. I don't like it. And, uh, but as I saw her grow older, what I saw was her longing for heaven. She would talk about it. Longing for heaven to depart be with Christ is far better. And I saw that grow. In Romans 8, it says that we groan within ourselves, longing for the redemption of our bodies. They say that a seasoned sailor can smell land before he sees it. How true that is. And as we grow older, you know, we think how hard it is to grow old, the joy that's set before us, when every tear will be wiped away, and there will be no more death and all things will be made new. That's, that's not a fairy tale, folks. That's just true because the next verse says, these words are faithful and, and they are true from Revelation. So last of all, um, many of us growing older, maybe you have a, a, a bucket list. You have a bucket list, right? You, gotta, you know, before I, before I cross that finish line, I'd like to, and you fill in the blank, right? Maybe you'd like to travel somewhere. Uh, maybe you'd like to skydive. I don't know, whatever that is. For me, you know, I'd like to go um, elk hunting in uh, Montana with a bow. That's what I'd like to do. Or, or fly fish in New Zealand. Wouldn't that be cool? I may never get to do that, but, you know, he got a bucket list. But several weeks ago, I was having coffee with a friend. Um, you may know him, Greg Robson. He's been on a video here. And Greg is in his early 40s. And uh, Greg has really gone through a difficult time uh, battling colon cancer. And we were just getting caught up, and, and he had actually was doing pretty well with the colon cancer. It pretty much went in remission. But then he said to me, but John, now I've got something even worse than that. I'm going, Oof, what could be worse than colon cancer, right? He says, I have va vasco vasco vasculitis, I think it's called. Anyway, it's not good. 
And he said, the doctors are predicting that within a year I could lose total hearing, my eyesight, and my ability to speak. Well, when he told me that, I was like, oh my God. This, I, I was just heartbroken for this guy. But what he said to me next almost knocked me off my chair. And you'd think, wow, what's in your bucket list, Greg? If you're, you know, get her done quick. What he said to me, well, I'll never forget. He says, all I want to do is I want to, I want to love well. I want to love well. And my last point is make it your greatest ambition to love well. It was said of the Apostle John, who lived longer than mostly all of the disciples or the apostles. And it's said of him, historians say that when he was really up in age, where he couldn't really walk much or wouldn't speak sermons, that they would help him up in the middle of an assembly. And he would simply say, beloved, love one another. And then he would sit down. Imagine that. Jesus, when his final commandments to his disciples said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. And by this, they will know that you are my disciples. I want to introduce you in closing with to a, a friend. Her name is Betty Skinner. You get a picture of her on the screen there. Uh, I kind of met Betty through a book that was on a bookshelf somewhere in the ad med wing. And I thought, oh, what's this? It's a book called uh, The Hidden Life Awakened. And I, and I read some of the forewords. It, was, it piqued my interest. So I took the book and I started reading it. And it's about her story. Uh, Kitty Crenshaw and Kathy Sapp. Uh, write her story. And uh, in her mid-40s, she went through a serious midlife crisis, depressed uh, and hospitalized for like six months, very severe and, and really hard. But it's her story of recovery in how she grew into this relationship with Christ that was so deep. And she experienced a lot through the writings of some ancient writers like Julian of Norwich about the love of God. And somehow her heart was so opened uh, to experience the love of God that that's what poured out of her. So I shared the book with a couple of my colleagues and they really liked it and said, man, we got to meet this woman. She lives in Jacksonville. So one of my interns said, you know, let's go meet her. So they were, she arranged a meeting. So she's in this nursing home in Jacksonville. So we head to Jacksonville and we met Betty. You know, she's got this little device so she could hear us. And, and uh, I want to tell you something. When I look into the eyes of that woman, love poured out of her. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience to someone who had drank deep into the love of God. That out of that came love. Well, Betty is home with the Lord now. She was in her mid-90s. And um, she was writing letters close to her death. And here's one that she wrote. Dear ones, here in the silence of my tiny room at the nursing home, I sit lonely. The diminishments of pain and of aging continuing unremittingly. I cannot hear. My eyesight is failing rapidly. And now my joy and comfort in the companionship of my children and dear friends has been taken away by this pandemic. I am locked in as we all endure this new sorrow and uncertainty, as we seek common ground in a world shattered by disease, hostility, and violence, as we stumble under the weight of loss and grief. How can we know and believe that God is with us? My dear friends, Jesus eases the intensity of the pain and helps me stay focused on love enabling me to go forward and release everything to him, knowing that no matter how the circumstances unfold, all shall be well. Jesus was always talking about love. Nothing else mattered to him. Everything he did was about setting the example of love. He fed the poor. He healed the desperate sick. Never to show off his power or gain greater following, but because he was moved to tears by their suffering. He refused to bend to the hypocrisy of the religious without love. 
When an angry mob of churchmen threw a woman caught in adultery at his feet, he rose powerfully to her in defense in a very volatile situation, daring the one without sin to throw the first stone. After they slunk away, he helped her up to her feet and totally without judgment called her to a higher way, the way of love. I want to close with this poem. It's a poem that I often read and reflect on uh, at memorial services. It always helps me re realize my own mortality and what am I doing with my life? It's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But what he said that mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represented all that time that she spent alive on earth, and know only those who love her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we love and live and how we spend our dash. So think about this, long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel. Be less quick to anger, show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we never loved before. If we treat each other with respect, and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when our eulogy is being read, with our life's actions to rehash, would we be proud of the things they say about how we spent our dash? Would you pray with me? God, our Father, we're thankful that you've given us life. And for Father, you've invited us to run a race. Father, you've told us over and over in your word that you're good and that you're trustworthy, that you're with us. You'll never leave us. Father, I pray for anybody right now that is just struggling with life and they're wondering, where are you, God? Lord, that you would show up in some surprising kind of way with your deep love for them. And Father, would you help us to discipline ourselves and to hear you speak to us through your word. And Lord, as we go closer to that finish line and feel the aches and pains and hardships of life, would you help us to view heaven? How would help us to, to know that beyond this life is the joy of heaven, unspeakable and beyond comparison. And we're thankful because all this is possible because of Jesus, the one who went before us, who ran the race, finished the course, and gives us life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. One final encouragement to you guys. Out there, there's some artwork from CAC. Go check that out. Also, I would like to just challenge you boomers, <laughs> okay, of which I'm one of them. Uh, whether you're retired or not retired, I would really encourage you, if you feel as though yeah, you're just kind of winding down and sliding for home, don't do that. You know, it's not over yet. Think about and pray about the things that God would still have you really engaged in loving well, in serving. We have, I'll tell you what, I, I look out here and I see some amazing seniors that are serving and, and you're finishing well. God bless you. May we all do that. But I want to, yes, amen, amen. So faithful. I see Amy and Bob that sit back there. Amy is struggling with health things and she's here this morning. And I'm thinking, my goodness. How do you do this? She goes, I just trust the Lord. <laughs> oh, man. But I want to encourage you, seriously. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to die with my boots on. Absolutely. You know, retirement is kind of a foreign thing. It's not in the Bible. And it's actually new to this country. Yeah, yeah. The early days, people worked until they died. So if that's you, it's not over. So press on. And, and the last of all... Um, to go a little bit deeper into this study, I would encourage you to take a look at a deep, deeper, digging deeper study that Dr. Teresa McGaskill does. 
Uh, check it out. It really dives deeper into Paul's final days and pouring himself out as a drink offering. goes into that historically. Really, really a rich study. And I would encourage you to, to further your time in that. So with that, I will like you to stand and receive this benediction. This is from Paul's writings to the 2 Corinthians. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go out and love on somebody today. <laughs>